Well, it is indeed good to be here. And um, I am grateful for the opportunity to share not only God's word, but particularly this topic and this subject that means so much to me. Let me just give you a little background on the whole idea of expository apologetics. Um, so at Grace Family Baptist Church, we planted the church in 2006, and um, our immediate goal was to be a reproducing church, a church planting church. And so we started trying to raise up men, train men to send out as, as church planters. And um, in the midst of that process, um, one of my fellow elders, this is several years into the process, one of our fellow elders who had come through the process, I uh, was teaching one day and, and, and he came afterwards and said, why don't you teach us that? And I said, what is that? He said, that thing you do. I said, what is that thing I do? So for the next, really for the next several weeks, we just started talking about um, this, this process and really what we ended up talking about um, was the way that I uh, look at scripture and teach scripture and, and preach, um, which is where the whole idea and name expository apologetics came from. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always thinking in terms of apologetics. Um, when I preach, I'm thinking in terms of apologetics. Um, I believe that every sermon ought to be an apologetic sermon. Um, and the only way that you understand that is if you understand the way I'm defining apologetics. And we'll get to that here in, in this session. Um, but we are always, always confronting unbelief. Amen? We're always confronting unbelief. And I think one of the mistakes that we make is we come into the pulpit and we think that what we're confronting is misbehavior, right? And so we preach to behavior. Don't do this, do that. Well, I'm convinced that we behave in accordance with what we believe. And if I preach to behavior and don't preach to belief, people may amend their behavior temporarily but they will not amend it permanently because they will eventually go back to behaving in accordance with what they believe. So what we have to do is attack the wrong believing that is leading to wrong behaving. Amen, somebody, okay? We've got to get to the root and not just the fruit. And if that's what I'm doing in my preaching, if whatever, you know, when I'm looking at indicatives and imperatives in Scripture, and when I come to those imperatives, I want to lean hard on those imperatives, but I want to get to the root. I want to get to the indicatives that lead to those imperatives so that I can now press hard there so that I can say not only is this where we're going wrong in our behaving, but here's the believing that's wrong that keeps leading us to this behaving. Believe differently. Folks, that's apologetics. That's apologetics. And we ought to be doing that every time we preach. Every time we preach. Not to mention the fact that there are always people in our midst who are listening to what we're saying and saying, I don't believe that. Prove it. And we ought to. We ought to, whenever we're preaching. Here's, here, here is, here's a statement that I'm making, right? Here's a proposition that I'm putting forth. It better not come from me. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. It better not come from me. It better be coming from the text. And if it is, I better be able to prove it, right? That's apologetics, folks. Okay? It's apologetics. And when we tweak our thinking this way, it changes the way that we prepare our sermons. It changes the way that we, that we read the scriptures. 
And I have to confess that this is, this is something that I came to mainly because of the way that I came to faith. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up around Christians. I didn't grow up around Christianity. Um, I, I was, you know, born and raised in drug-infested, gang-infested South Central Los Angeles, California. Born in 1969. So that puts me, you know, coming of age in the early 80s and drug-infested, gang-infested, crack cocaine-infested, drive-by, shooting-infested Los Angeles, raised by a single teenage Buddhist mother. I never heard the gospel till I got to university. So when I came to faith, it wasn't, you know, yeah, all these years of my training in Christianity and going to Sunday school and this, that, and the other. It was, you know, a guy came to me and he tried to, to go through the four spiritual laws and realize I didn't have enough background information for that to make sense to me. So he had to back up. And, and, and he was, you know, he had... He had come to um, the locker room. I know you can't probably can't believe this, but I played football in college. And he had come to the locker room to talk to me. And he was, you know, this Green Bay Packer fan from Wisconsin. And uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, he realizing that you know, he's got to get more basic, you know, um, he, he does his best Lombardi. You know, Lombardi's like, man, this is a football, right? <laughs> he goes, Bodhi, this is a Bible. <laughs> and that's where we started. And we spent three weeks with him just teaching me basic things, me asking questions, and him answering those questions. If he couldn't find the answers to the question, he would go and find the answers to the question. Toward the end of our time together, he would take me to find the answers to the questions. So I like to say I was being trained in apologetics before I was converted, right? So admittedly, this is a, this is a more natural thing for me because I did come to the Bible as one saying, yeah, I don't believe that, prove it. And so when I'm preparing to teach, when I'm preparing to preach, I, I'm still thinking about that guy, right? Because he's out there and he's saying, prove it. I don't believe that. And as a presuppositionalist, I, I'm, I'm not, when I say prove it, right? I, I'm not saying I'm going to, you know, get into your worldview and prove it from your worldview. I, I'm going to prove from my presupposition. Right? I'm going to prove that this is what the Bible says, that this is what God says. And of course, what we've been conditioned to from all the other approaches to apologetics out there is we've been conditioned to that, you know, well, well what about the person who says, I, I don't believe the Bible? And the other approaches to apologetics, you know, they basically say, well, you know, if a person doesn't believe the Bible, then what you have to do is, you have to go to something else so that you can bring them back to the Bible. Yeah, I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Here's the way I look at it. There are two knights who meet along the way. They're opposing knights from opposing kingdoms. They dismount, one draws his sword, and the other looks at him and says, I do not believe in thine sword. Knight number one has a couple of options. Option number one, he can resheathe his sword and begin to wax scientific and philosophical about the danger of his sword and why his opponent ought to believe in it. I like door number two. 
just cut him. <laughs> Eventually, he will believe or it won't matter. But that's not our approach. It's amazing how now I, we've been fed these approaches to apologetics that basically have us saying, you know, we pull out our Bible. Somebody says, I don't believe in the Bible. So we go, OK, I'll put away the Bible. What you, here's what you've just said. Here is the authority. And they say, I don't believe in that authority. I believe that there are authorities that are higher than that one or more important to that one or at least equal to that one. And if the minute you close your Bible, you say you win. I agree. I agree that there's a higher authority than the Bible. Or at least authority that's equal to the Bible. I'm saying, no, I don't agree with that. I don't believe the Bible. Well, good for you. So what the Bible says is, I told you I don't believe in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. And I'm telling you that I don't believe in your presuppositions, but you're not giving up yours, so I'm not giving up mine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate that mine are consistent and yours are not. So what the Bible says, <laughs> huh? All right. So let's start. What time am I supposed to finish this session? 10, 15. All right, we're good. So let's define apologetics first. Cornelius Van Til writes, apologetics is the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of the non-Christian philosophy of life. I love that definition. It's the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of the non-Christian philosophy of life. Everybody else is arguing the same thing. They're just arguing various forms of the same thing. There's the Christian philosophy of life and there's the non-Christian philosophy of life. There's not the Christian philosophy of life or the Christian worldview and then the Buddhist or the Hindu or the Islamic or the pagan or the atheist. No, they're just, there's the Christian and there's the non-Christian. That's the world. There's us and there's them. Amen? That's it. There's one truth and everything else is falsehood. And this is about the vindication of the truth against the various forms of the not true. That's apologetics. Let me give you this working definition. Apologetics is merely knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and being able to communicate that to others effectively. Knowing what we believe knowing why we believe it and being able to communicate that to others effectively. That, that's it. That, that's apologetics. Plain and simple. Um, you know, when we look at the very text from which we get the word apologetics, there in 1 Peter 3, 15, that, that word apologia, that it means a, a reasoned response, Right? Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. Okay? Know what you believe. Know why you believe it. Right? And, and then we're to give that answer in a particular way. Gentleness and reverence. Right? So we're to be able to communicate it effectively. If I don't know what I believe, I can't answer if I don't know why I believe, my answer will be insufficient. What do you believe? Well, I believe this. Why do you believe that? Well, just cuz. That's not apologetics, right? And we, there is a way we have to answer. It has to be winsome and it has to be effective. 
And all of these things are important in apologetics. Know what you believe. Know why you believe it. And be able to communicate that in a winsome and effective way. If any one of those things is missing, then you're not doing apologetics. You're doing a disservice to our Lord. Amen? God forbid we don't know what we believe. But there's enough of that going around, right? God forbid that we don't know why we believe it. There's way too much of that going around. God forbid that we know what we believe and why we believe it, but don't care enough to prepare ourselves to communicate it in a winsome and effective manner. All of those are important. Our view of apologetics, and this is where the problem comes in. We believe, number one, that apologetics is for elite Christians. We believe apologetics is for elite Christians, the elite of the elite. The Green Beret, Navy SEAL, Marine Force Recon, Delta Force Christian, right? You gotta be all of that. that. Apologetics is for those people. And the rest of us just sit in awe as they march by. Shh, here come the apologists, right? We do, we believe that they're like another class of Christians. We believe that apologetics requires knowledge of science, philosophy, logic, debate, history, and everything else that you can imagine, right? And whatever it is that you have, you believe apologetics requires the stuff that you don't. And we don't engage, why? Well, I'm not an elite Christian, and I don't have all of the knowledge of all of these things that apologetics requires. And after all, I mean, when you hear people talk about apologetics, you know, you just go away going, wow, that guy's brilliant. He knows everything. I could never do that. Thirdly, we believe that apologetics requires knowledge of royal religions, cults, and heresies. All world religions, all cults, and all heresies. If you don't know all that stuff, then you can't do apologetics. Finally, we believe that apologetics requires an edge of confidence, even arrogance. Don't look at me like that. You know it's true. We believe, you know, apologetics, we think that you gotta be a little, you know, a little, a little, a little, a little, just a little arrogant. Just a little, just a little. You'd be an apologist, right? This is why teenage boys love apologetics. They do, they do. You just, you know, want to be an apologist. Really? I believe you. Because all you do is argue with your parents all the time, right? Everybody's wrong and you're right. You've learned 15 facts and you think you're the smartest dude in the whole world. Now you want to go do apologetics. Go home. <laughs> you put these things together and this is why most Christians either feel like they can't or, or they don't want to engage in apologetics. Who wants, to, who wants to be that guy? Right? And there are a lot of Christians who, who really have a problem with apologetics in the current age. Because in the current age, we wrestle with the 11th commandment. And the 11th commandment is, thou shalt be nice. And we don't believe the other 10. This is why you can say things, and I, you know, so I, I'm not a fan of social media, but I use social media as a petri dish. Just kind of put stuff out there see where people are and how they respond. I don't necessarily want to fix it. I'm just trying to find something out. So I put something out there and I watch people respond and it, and it happens and there it is. And I'm like, boom, there's my point. Just proved it. Everybody else is like, whoa, whoa, whoa you just going to let that go? I'm like, yeah, I wanted to prove a point. There it was. 
And I can't tell you how many times I've said something about a contemporary issue. Um, you, I mean, you name it. You talk about you know, homosexuality, transgender, or this or this, whatever. And you throw the thing out there. And, and there are the people, there are the 11th commandment Christians who come. And every problem that we have in the world is a result of Christians not being nice enough. It just, it just sounds so offensive the way you said that. And, da, 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 da. and I'll bite, but only to prove another point. And here's, here's the point that I want to prove. I come back and I say, you know, I, just, I think it's very interesting. Um, I brought up the people who are engaging in this sin that was so heinous that God destroyed Twin Cities with fire and brimstone and they're shaking their fists at God and flaunting their sin, and you're more offended by me confronting them than you are by their debauchery. How does that work? And it, it's true, folks. That's the age in which we live. The 11th commandment Christian is more offended by you planting your feet, squaring your shoulders, lifting your head high and saying the Bible says that's sin than they are by the debauchery of our age. They look at the sin and debauchery of our age and they want to come bowing and genuflecting and weeping and wailing and apologizing for Christians not being nice enough over the ages. And they, that, that's, that's their response. No offense whatsoever. There's nothing in them that wants to get up on their hind legs and say no until you confront sin. And then they're ready to go to battle. Because that's the only battle worth fighting. Christians not being nice enough. And by the way, not being nice enough, but like manliness is not nice enough. Amen. I mean, you stand up and read Romans chapter 1, and you just, you're, that, that wasn't nice. I mean, that was God. What are, you, what are you talking about? And here's the result. Here's the result. Imagine this scenario. I'm opening my Bible, and, and I'm going to preach on um, adultery. Um, no, but listen. Before I, I get to my text, before I get to my sermon, I just want to say that I have dear friends who are adulterers. And I, I love adulterers. And we should all love adulterers. I am not here today, you know, to, to, to bash adulterers. They are people made in God's image and, and, and adultery is... That's exactly how y'all would be looking at me if I started my adultery sermon like that, right? Or whatever else. What are, you, what are you talking about? But every time a pastor gets up and preaches on homosexuality, his sermon dies the death of a thousand qualifications. Because you got to start with, now listen, I love homosexuals. I believe God calls us to love homosexuals. I don't believe it. What is that about? That's about the 11th commandment, Christian. Because that pastor could stand up and preach about a thousand other sins with no apology, pound the pulpit and thunder forth the word of God and even be a little mean, a little nasty about it. And nobody will write anything. But you get on homosexuality, transgender, right? And I mean, all of a sudden, <laughs> you, you apologize 999 times, but there's one time when you made a statement that you didn't qualify 
with love and sappiness. And that's what they're going to write you about. So engaging in apologetics in that context, oof. a lot of people have just figured, why bother? Well, we bother because it matters. We see apologetics throughout Scripture in a number of different forms. In the Old Testament, we see apologetics, but you have to really understand the worldview of the ancient Near East to understand the way apologetics is being done. In the ancient Near East, uh, for example, when, even when nations went to war, it wasn't just Assyria going to war with Egypt. It was the Assyrian gods doing battle with the Egyptian gods, and whoever won proved the supremacy of their gods. Amen? This is why you defeat a nation and you sack their temple and take off, you know, all of the artifacts, take away all of the artifacts from their temple because symbolically what you're saying is our God just defeated your God. Amen? So in that context, Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16, we, we look at the plagues and the purpose of the plagues. What's the purpose of the plagues? Because what would you think? You would think that Israel is under the boot of Egypt. Therefore, Egypt's gods are all powerful and Israel's gods are weak, right? Exodus 9, 16. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. That's the purpose of the plagues. You ever wonder, I mean, why, why, why the first nine? Why the first nine, man? You just needed the last one. Amen? Let's just get this over with. Let's just do it. Let's be done with it. But you had the first nine plagues addressing Egypt's worldview and their theology all along the way. But why? If you're just going to wipe them out, why do you need to address their worldview and their theology? Because God wasn't just getting Israel out of Egypt. He was getting Egypt out of Israel. Their worldview had been affected. And some apologetics needed to be done. And in case you don't believe me, just look at what happens when they get out. What do they do? They go build a golden calf because there's still a lot of Egypt in the Israelites. First Samuel 17, 46 and 47. David goes to battle with Goliath. And in many ways, he was doing apologetics. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. How about that for the 11th commandment, Christians? Huh? David wasn't nice. Amen. Neither is his descendant who sits on the throne. Jesus is not nice. He's coming back with a sword on his thigh, fire in his eyes. He's coming back to wreck some stuff, y'all. He is not coming back lowly Jesus, meek and mild, with a lamb across his shoulders. He's coming back as a conquering king and a warrior. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. Folks, notice, just like in Egypt, this is not just so that the Philistines could know, but so that the fearful Israelites, who for 40 days couldn't find a man among them, to go and fight. The Israelites 
who had chosen a king because he was head and shoulders taller than all the rest of the Israelites. A man who physically would have been a match for Goliath. Saul would have been somewhere along the lines of, I don't know, 6'6". Six, six? Big dude, especially in that era. And you're going, yeah, man, but <laughs> Goliath, <laughs> dude, he's like eight feet tall. Right, exactly. Let's go to the NBA. Most of the greatest players in the NBA are right there in that slot, right? 6'4 to 6'9". There's bigger dudes, but they get to a certain size and it's hard for them to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. <laughs> so you give me a Michael Jordan sized guy with some skills, that's Saul. Against a big lumbering giant, I'm taking, the, I'm taking six six over eight feet. All day, every day, and twice on Sunday, right? As long as you don't let him grab you, right? So physically, Saul had a tremendous chance. But he didn't volunteer to go fight. So not only did God need to do apologetics with the Philistines, again, here, he needs to do apologetics with Israel. Remember what I said earlier? When we preach to our people, we're doing apologetics. Huh? Isaiah 37, 20. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. We could go to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, the first half of the book of Daniel, is all about apologetics. What happens? God brings Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to defeat his people and take them off into captivity. In the ancient Near East, what that means is Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian gods are superior to Israel and Israel's gods. And over and over and over again in the first half of the book of Daniel, God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, um, you defeated my people because I chose that you would do that, but I'm still God. Let us not eat what they eat. Right? Why? Because God is God. No, nope, we're not going to bow before the statue. Throw them in the fiery furnace. Not only do they not die, they got help in there. Why? Because God is God. Throw Daniel into the lion's den. They don't eat him. Why? Because God is God. So over and over and over again in the book of Daniel, we have apologetics. Not just so that Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar can know that they have not defeated the God of Israel, but also so that Israel will know you're in captivity, but your God is still God. And just like Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 29, he's going to bring you back. Because he never stopped being God. So, so we see Apologetics here in the Old Testament. Another thing that we need to see is, is this. Apologetics is not just for the elite Christian. We see apologetics, for example, as a requirement for pastoral ministry. Titus 1.9. He must hold firm the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. That's every elder. That's every pastor. That's not elite pastors trained in apologetics. That's anyone who assumes the mantle. Amen? Not only that, 1 Peter 3.15. And... 
we may look at this, we'll look at this more carefully tonight. But in this section, Peter has gone from the general to the more uh, specific and now back to the general and he's talking to all believers here. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's all believers. All believers are called to know what they believe, why they believe it, and to be ready, willing, and able to communicate that effectively. All believers, all Christians, Jude, Jude 1 and 2. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, who's this for? For those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Um, not only is this a, a, a sort of rabbinical teaching tool repeating something over and over again, but he repeats three times talking about the same group of people. And also, not only is he repeating three times talking about the same group of people, but in this triple you know, repetition, we, we have a Trinitarian formation, a formulation. Those who are called, we'll leave that for now, beloved in God the Father, so we have the Father, kept for Jesus Christ, we have God the Son. So who, who's the one who calls? God the Spirit. Those who are called by the Spirit, loved by the Father, and kept by the Son. This is a triune reference to the triune God. But to whom is the writer referring? I, I don't know. Whom has the Spirit called? The elite of the elite? Whom does the Father love? Uh, just those with special training. Whom does Jesus keep? Folks, this is all of us. Amen? If it's not all of us, then only some of us have assurance. This is all of us. This is all of us. But to what is he calling us? Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So to whom is he speaking? All Christians. And to what does he call us? Apologetics. Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This is also a primary, not a secondary issue. It's a primary, not a secondary issue. Notice that he said, although I was very eager to, you, to write to you about our common salvation, right? Here's an apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who says, I was eager to write to you about salvation, but instead I'm writing to you, whoa, wait a minute. He was gonna, I was going to write to you about salvation, but there was something of such importance that either I'm not writing to you about our common salvation anymore, which I don't believe that for a minute, or this thing that I'm talking to you about is part and parcel of writing about our common salvation. But regardless of which formulation you take, this is a primary, not a secondary issue. This is a primary issue that rises to the level of our common salvation. But why? Look at what he says. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Why is this of such significance? It's of such significance because there are those who have crept in, there are those who have crept in, they're, they're in among us, they're in our ranks, 
and having crept in among us, there's two things that they're doing. One, they turn grace into lawlessness, and two, they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. In other words, they're perverting the gospel. They're perverting the gospel. This answers a couple of questions. Number one, it answers why apologetics is primary and not secondary. Amen? And number two, it answers why... We're not necessarily nice. Not necessarily nice. Not harsh. Not sinful. Not even mean. But the text says that we're to agonize greatly. And the root word that he uses here is a word that is associated with wrestling in the arena. We're to fight. We're to go to battle. We're to go to war. This ain't chess. It's not checkers. This is war. That's the illustration that he uses here. He doesn't say that we're, you know, we're to strategize, we're to uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. We're to do what wrestlers do. What warriors do when they go to combat with one another. Do they violate the rules? Are they unethical? No, they're not. But they're also not nice. Amen? Excuse me, I'm going to take you down now. <laughs> oh, please go right ahead. No, uh-uh. That's not the picture here. But why? Why? Because you can't be saved by a perverted gospel. That's why. We're defending the honor in the name of Christ and the truth of the gospel. That's why we're going to battle here. Because if they're perverting the gospel and people are believing a perverted gospel, then they've believed in vain, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15. Because a perverted gospel won't save. You're not saved by your sincerity. Amen? If, if I give you my, my phone number, right, and, and I'm like, okay, fine, Here, here's, here's my phone number, give me a call. Then you say, hey, yeah, I got a, my buddy wants to call you too. Can I, can I give him your number? Yeah, sure. If you give him a number that's one digit off, does his sincerity in dialing matter? Huh? I'll give you my email address. And you're like, you know, I, I, I just found out yesterday I was, I've been emailing some stuff to my doctor. When I come back to the States, I usually try to go through Houston some time to go and see my doctor. And, um, you know, I, I emailed him some stuff, and he said, man, I don't have that. I don't have that. And I went and looked on my contacts, and I had one, two letters just misplaced, right? Just two letters misplaced. And he didn't get my email. That's what this is about. God is not, God has not hidden himself. He, he, he said, here I am. This is me. This is how you know me. Here's who I am. Here's where I am. Here's how you find me. 
And we're proclaiming the gospel and we're saying, here's who God is. Here's where God is. Here's how you find him. And there are those out there while we're proclaiming, here's who God is. Here's where he is. Here's how you find him. There are people out there saying, actually, he's over here. Imagine you, you leave here today and after the session is over and you, hey, man, how you doing? You got your name tag on? What are you doing? Yeah, you know, we're at this conference and, you know, we're listening to this guy, this, um, this Voody, Vod, Voody Va, something, Voody bitch something. And they go, wait, Voody Bauckham? Ah, yeah, that's it, Voody Bauckham. Wait, <laughs> wait, the Voody Bauckham. It could happen. And they're like, the Vodibach, yeah, man, I guess, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah, the Vodibach, really, he said, wow, that is awesome. I can't believe, I mean, he's here in Detroit, yeah. You sure it's the Vodibach? I mean, how many can there be, right? <laughs> Yo, yeah, a little short white guy from Mississippi. <laughs> At this point, you've got two choices. Kind of like the night, right? At this point, you could go, well, that's your interpretation. <laughs> or you say, nope, you're actually talking about somebody else. That's what we're dealing with here. God has said, this is who I am. And there are people out there going, well, actually. And overwhelmingly, the world has chosen to respond. That's your interpretation. But folks, God is not running for God. Amen? Amen? He was the only one around when the votes were cast. There's never going to be a recount. He's God. He is who he says he is. And no one has the right to recast him or reinterpret him. And that's why we fight. Because souls... Souls are at stake here. That's our passion. That's our desire. And that's why this is a primary issue. That, that's why it's something that's not negotiable. The time that we have left, if that's apologetics, what we do and why we do, then what about expository apologetics? This is not about preparing yourself to defeat Christopher Hitchens in a formal debate, right? I mean, if you know, if you want to, more power to you. Um, but those types of things. Uh, don't come around very often and quite honestly tend to have limited impact. That's not what this is about. This is about you taking seriously your duty and your responsibility as a Christian to know what you believe and why you believe it and to be able to communicate that to others in a winsome and effective way. And so with expository apologetics, there's three key characteristics. This needs to be biblical. It needs to be simple. It needs to be conversational. It needs to be biblical, simple, and conversational. All right? Um, let me take a stab at this, the biblical side. The limiting and limited nature of the gospel is what allows us to approach apologetics from a biblical perspective. 
And when I say the limited and limiting nature of the gospel, I mean, for example, the canon is closed. We're, we're, we're not getting new revelation. I know there's some people who would disagree with that, but you know, I respect their right to be wrong. Um, for the sake of time, I'll just give you these references. Deuteronomy 4.2, Deuteronomy 12.32, Proverbs 30, verse 6, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, Revelation 22.18, right? All of these don't add to my word passages. Um, again, we're not getting new revelation. We have God's revelation. The canon is closed. Therefore, there are a limited number of things we believe. That's number one. There's a limited number of things we believe. Number two, there are a limited number of objections that can be raised. Number three, there are a limited number of objections that we need to answer. And number four, our source for those answers is the Bible, since the Bible is where they come from. That's the great benefit of this approach to apologetics. It's not, you need to know everything about everything, okay? And, and, and I'm not saying that it's wrong and that it's never profitable, for example, to learn about a particular movement or a particular idea. When, when we're doing pastoral ministry, especially, there are things that encroach on our territory and it's incumbent upon us to learn about those things so that we can respond very specifically to them, right? Amen? That's different than saying apologetics equals knowing everything about everything so that you can, that, 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 that's different, okay? If there's a limited number of objections to the gospel message and those objections have been answered in the scriptures under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then the clearest most appropriate and most powerful responses that we can give to people's objections is the responses that we find in scripture. I am not responsible for defending what I do not believe. I am not responsible for defending what I do not believe. I'm also not responsible for defending heresy. And I'm not responsible for defending assumptions or straw men. In, in other words, you know, somebody says, well, you know, well, why do you Christians believe whatever? If it's not what I believe, I'm not responsible for defending that. Amen? I just kind of go, yeah, that, that, I don't believe that. Well, well, but, you know, there's people out there who, yeah, you can talk to them. I don't believe that. Here's what I believe. It's kind of like when somebody comes to you with a charge against Rome, right? Well, you Christians and, 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 the, and the Inquisition, and the, I, I, yeah, I wasn't there. <laughs> wasn't me, wasn't my people, right? Um, yeah, let's talk about what I believe, okay? Do you, do you see this? I'll end with this. I was in um, Oregon, I was at Oregon State University, which I guess Corvallis, maybe that's where Oregon State is. And I'd been invited up there, I was doing some preaching in the area, was invited to come to the campus. And um, on the campus they just wanted me to come and talk about the validity of the Bible for about 30 minutes and then do Q&A. So I get there and there's this campus ministry that's, um, you know, got everything prepared. And I'm walking around and there's just, there's flyers up and there are these little dinky flyers. You know, come listen, you know, Dr. Vodibachum address, you know, the validity of the Bible, da, da, da. And I'm like, so what else have y'all done? Like nothing, we just put up these flyers. And I'm just sitting there going, nobody's coming. Cause I mean, if, if I'm on campus and I'm, I'm passing my, who is this guy? What is it, you know? I mean, it's, it's Oregon. This is, it's Oregon. There's, so, you know, they've got this student center and booked and everything. And so I go to the back, this back room in the student center and just as honest as I can be, guys, I'm praying, but I'm praying that the Lord will just give me wisdom 
um, for how to minister to these students when their event flops. And they come back to get me and they're like, we're ready. And I walk out. It is wall to wall. And I looked at the guy and I said, where did all these people come from? Like, these are the students. They're here for the... <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Told you how you probably needed a bigger space, right? You know? <laughs> and so I, I do my thing for half an hour. And I, again, I... I this, Living and, and ministering in Texas, I've been, spent my, my adult life in, in, in Texas and my ministry life in Texas. And, you know, you do a, an event like this in Texas, and first of all, students are not going to show up. Um, and if they do, you know, they're basically going to be asking the kind of questions that are designed to show off their own intelligence and whatever. 30 minutes about the Bible, its history and validity, and open it up for questions for the next two hours. And we've got Baha'i, Wiccans, um, you know, uh, Muslims, Buddhists. We, and the questions are just as honest as the day is long. I had a blast. So we finish, and afterwards we're getting ready to go to eat. And the students, you know, who organize this thing, we're all riding, and everybody's just looking straight ahead. Nobody's looking at me, nobody's talking. And I'm like, Guys, what'd you think? And the one guy went, dude, that was awesome. And that was it. Everybody's just like, yeah, that was awesome. I'm like, well, you know, talk to me about it. And one of the guys in the back kind of goes, to be honest, we're a little intimidated right now. He said, why? He said, dude, you didn't have the questions ahead of time. You stood there for two hours. These people ask you questions and they answer your questions and they would, dude, it was awesome. <laughs> and I sat there and I went, I said, you realize that there are only six to eight categories of questions that anybody could ever ask you about the Bible. And if you have a working knowledge of those six or eight categories. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Nobody's ever going to ask you a question that you won't be prepared for. If they do, it'll be something outside of the canon of scripture and you don't need to answer it. <laughs> hey, you go, huh? Yeah, you realize systematic theology texts all have the same categories because there are a limited number of categories and therefore a limited number of questions that you're ever going to have to answer because we're answering what we believe based on what God has revealed of himself in the Bible. I didn't have to answer the Baha'i about everything that Baha'is believe. I just had to answer the person from the Baha'i faith based on the question that they asked about our faith. And if somebody from the Wiccan religion tells me that as a Wiccan they believe this, well, it's going to be something because they're a ripoff, right? No, they have no original thoughts. They're a ripoff and a perversion of biblical truth. Well, if I know the category of, of, of biblical truth that they've ripped off and perverted, I can respond to their religion the first time I ever hear about it. And all of a sudden the lights came on. Oh. Uh, Know what you believe. Know why you believe it. And be ready and willing and able to communicate that in a winsome and effective manner. That's it. Now, we'll get into the specifics of how we do this, right? 
how we prepare for it. We'll get into all that. But for now, just have the big picture. Okay? Just have the categories. And let go of the ridiculous idea that apologetics is only for the elite of the elite. Delta Force, Green Beret, Marine Force, Recon, Navy SEAL, Christian. It's not. It's not. Praise God for those types of people. Amen? Because they can, they can take it to a whole nother level on some very specific issues. And we thank God for that. Amen? But if we have the mindset that that is apologetics and only that, well, then not only are we neglecting our duty as Christians, but we're also leaving people in our sphere without answers when we're supposed to be prepared to give them to them. I've gone over my time. My apologies. But I flew here from Africa, man. I'm sure that's worth five minutes, huh? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you. Again, we rejoice and we are grateful. Help us to wrap our minds around these things and to be eager to pursue them to the glory of Christ. Amen.